All right, I encourage you to use the resources to talk about this at home, by the way. We always, we always have these resources. You can grab one on your way out or just find it online. But question number two, this is a great question for lunch after church today. What was your parents' goal in raising you? That same question that we asked them, what was their goal in raising you? And then the follow-up question is, do you think they accomplished it? Or did you accomplish their goal for you? How purposeful were they? Were they trying to move you towards something that they have a goal for you? My answer to that, I, you know, my parents, are, I, I was very blessed with great parents and am very blessed with great parents. And they, they always said to me, you can do whatever you want. They, my dad was a very encouraging dad. He always just said, you can do whatever you want. He convinced all of his kids that the sky was the limit. We could do anything that we wanted to do. In fact, he used to say, if you want to be the president of the United States, you could do that. And he convinced me that I could. He convinced me that if that's what I wanted, if that's what I aspired to, that I could be the president of the United States. I didn't really think about it until I watched that video that maybe actually that was his goal for me. And uh, if that's the case, then I have failed miserably because I am not the president and nor do I want to be the president. Thank you very much. But if you want to write me in because you don't know any other candidates that you want to vote for, you're welcome to. All right, I'm going to take this first section. So we're going to talk, you know, as we're, as we're preparing this sermon series, we thought we, we want to just make sure, obviously, these principles are biblical. Everything we're going to teach in these next three weeks are very biblical. So if you're a Christian, it's very biblical. If you're, someone, if you're a parent here who's you're not yet a Christian, you're just investigating, you're going to get a picture of what we believe biblical parenting is all about. Hopefully you'll gain from that as well. And maybe even that would help inspire you to want to follow Jesus and become a Christian. But... We, we, we sort of dug through the Bible and we thought, let's try, to, let's try to start this series off with a great example of parents from the Bible. And you know what? We couldn't find one. Just, so if you're here today and you're like, you know, I'm going to feel all beat up and I'm going to feel terrible because I'm a terrible parent or I'm going to be a terrible parent, I just want you to know, join the crowd. There are no good parents in the Bible, all right? If that's, I don't know if that's encouraging for you or not, but it really is true. There are... There are very few examples of good, godly parents. There are a ton of examples of unhealthy, dysfunctional, toxic parents in the Bible. And one of those is good old King David. David, from the Old Testament, was the greatest king in the history of Israel. But he was a failure as a, as a father. You know, David was a guy that we, we first were introduced to him when he... he slew the giant, young David, the shepherd boy, slew the giant with the, the slingshot and the stone. And this giant falls. And David went on to have this incredible career as a king and as a warrior and as a womanizer. And he had, he had all this purpose when it came to those things. But it, when it came to parenting, he, it, it appears that he had no plan. It appears that he was not purposeful whatsoever. And guys, I want to just say this to men in here right now. If you're a man, if you're a dad actively, or if you've been a dad, or if you're going to someday be a dad, this, this, I I just really encourage you, don't check out and make your wife take notes in this series. Men, you need to step up and lead at the home because I I think if you know the story of David, probably a lot of guys can relate to it. I know I can relate to it. I am very purposeful. I am very focused when it comes to my career, when it comes to writing sermons when it comes to being a pastor and leading the guys uh, on our team. I'm very purposeful with that, but I can tend to be more on the back burner at home. And <laughs> I've never seen her nod so violently. I mean, it's true. My, my kids, we, I have an office at home, and when I, my daughter recently called it the black hole. Because she said, when you go back there, we'd have, we don't know how many days it's going to be before you come out. And I know some of you men can relate to that. You're, you're, you're hard driving at work, and, you, and you, you know, you're, some of you, if you're successful at work, if you're a businessman or something, you're, you're very purposeful, you have a plan, you have a mission statement, all these things. But maybe when it comes to parenting, you kind of leave it to your wife. Or maybe you and your wife leave it to your kids. Or maybe you leave it to the oldest kid, you know. And it should, and you know, I just want to challenge you, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. We, we should be more purposeful. So King David, King David was like that. In fact, there's a story in the Old Testament. Uh, David had a lot of sons, and one of his sons, Amnon, Amnon and I'll, I'll spare you the gory details, but Amnon raped his half-sister Tamar, and David never said a thing about it. 
Talk about parenting without purpose or without a plan. He never said a thing about it. So what happened is Absalom, Tamar's brother, a, a couple years later, killed Amnon. So you think your family's dysfunctional? <laughs> so they, I don't, I, don't, I don't think anyone's family holds a candle to David's family when it comes to dysfunction. A later story in the Bible is where Absalom's brother, Adonijah, and this is when David was older, Adonijah tried to steal the throne of his father. And here's what the Bible says. This is a very, you know, the, the Bible does, it's not a parenting book. The Bible isn't a parenting book. So we have some of, the, some of the parenting lessons we have to extract from some of the stories. It doesn't really tell us exactly how David parented, but this verse gives us a hint about D David as a parent. It says this in 1 Kings 1, 6. Now his father, Adonijah's father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing that? This is the verse that explains, this is kind of the commentary on, so if you go read this chapter, it says that Adonijah tried to overthrow his father and take over the kingdom of Israel. And this is the parenting verse we get on that. David, not only in this instant, never even called his son out, but what it's saying is, David never called his children out. It just wasn't what he did. He wasn't purposeful. He didn't have a plan. He was super purposeful about taking this country and taking this country and destroying the Philistines. But he had no plan. He had no purpose. He was not intentional whatsoever with his kids, even when they're sinning and doing stuff that's terrible, like trying to take over his throne. He didn't discipline him at any time. And he never even asked, why are you doing that? I mean, that's like, like a, a whole different level of low. Like, Maybe some of you are like, no, that kind of describes my parenting. Not only do I not discipline someone, my kids, but I don't even meddle in their business. I don't even, I don't even ask them, hey, why, hey, so why are you doing that? What are you doing with your girlfriend there? Why are you doing that? What are you doing with your grades there? Why are you doing that? What are you doing in your pursuit of God? Why are you doing that or why aren't you doing that? And this is really, it, it's, this is an interesting example, and sadly, there are many examples like King David in the Old Testament of fathers and mothers that failed because they weren't very purposeful. Trace is going to take that next section. Okay, so here's the deal. King David didn't fail on purpose as a parent. He failed because he didn't parent on purpose. And that's kind of the goal of what we're talking about in the series is that I don't know what David's heart really was, but I know for me as a parent, and probably for most of you out there, our goal when we brought our kids home was not, oh man, I really hope I fail at this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, our goal is that we want to do it well, and we want our kids to, to be successful and to be well-adjusted. But David's problem was he had no plan. He had no, had, had no purpose or direction. So if we want to win at parenting, we have to start from that place of having a focus and a direction that we're trying to go. And even though Brian's words were very kind about me as a parent, I promise you there are many days that I have felt lost in the job of parenting. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. That's, that's fine. We'll have the back and forth. <laughs> but really, I mean, there have been many times where I remember when my daughter was starting junior high. I remember what junior high was like for me. And I'm thinking, oh boy, what are we in for? This is going to be three years. It's going to be a long journey. I just pray we get through it. That she comes through it as unscathed as possible, and as a parent, I feel like, okay, I didn't totally ruin it. But the problem with that is that isn't the goal of the, a winning parent. We need to have more of a plan than I just hope we get through it, right? Cross your fingers and good luck, kids. We need to have a focus and a direction. And I just wanted to share, there's a great resource in our library, and it's called Getting Five-Point Clarity for Your Family. And Brian and I used that last summer. We did the watch the video, and we went through this worksheet that it has where it helps you to create a family mission statement. It helps you identify what are your values as a family, and it talks about how, what's your vision for your family. Where do you see yourself going in five to seven years? And Brian and I did that as a couple last summer at a pretty key time. My daughter was you know, going into her sophomore year at the high school, and I knew there were going to be some challenges there. My son was starting junior high, and I thought, 
do we have a plan? What are we doing? You know, we only have our daughter for a couple more years. What, do, what should we be doing? What are we hoping to get our kids toward? What's our direction and what's our focus? So when we did that as a couple, it really helped us to kind of identify what's, what's our direction? What do we want for our kids? And then we did it as a family. And it was really instructive to hear from our kids what their vision was for themselves, where they see themselves in five to seven years. And what it helped us do is create a grid where, okay, so when situations come along, we know how to put it in its proper perspective because we have a direction and a focus. And everything Brian and I are doing now is, okay, one of our kids' goals is they see themselves both going to college. Great. What do we need to do as parents to add that into our value system that we're encouraging good grades and education? What are we doing to save money so that we can send them to college? And it just kind of gave us a direction and a focus that's kind of helped me as a mom instead of getting wigged out over you know, these situations that come along and the disappointments that our kids have, we can go back to that mission statement. We actually have them taped in our pantry door so the kids, every time they go to grab a snack, they can see what we filled out for our family mission statement. They see what their goals are for themselves. It just kind of reminds us how to go because here's, here's the deal. At the end of the day, if we don't have a plan, if we don't have a focus and a direction in parenting, we're going to become very reactionary. So picture yourself playing an intense game of dodgeball and you're getting pinned up against the wall and balls are just being chucked at you from every direction. You're in a defensive posture. As everything's coming, you're just reacting to everything that's coming your way. And as parents, I think a lot of us resort to that where we just start reacting to the environment. We start reacting to situations and we don't really know what to do or where we're trying to go. So we're just constantly feel out of control, lost, and insecure. So I just wanted to share a funny example for us. It wasn't funny at the time, but as Brian and I realized we were reactionary parents with my son, we, we pick on AJ a lot, but he's an easy target in some ways, but we love him. He's an amazing kid. But when he was a baby, he was the whiniest kid on the block. He just, any little thing he would be upset about, he would cry and he would whine. So as an infant, you're thinking, all right, well, maybe he has reflux. You know, we were really concerned about it. And then early toddler years were like, okay, well, I don't know. So we were just constantly reacting to his mood. And what I found as a mom is I was stressed all the time. Like, is today a good day? Did he get a nap? Do I have snacks in my bag? Do I have enough suckers in case he has a tantrum out in public? What's it going to be like dropping off at church today? Can I go to this event? Because I have no idea what kind of mood AJ is going to be in. And it was, it was stressful and it was hard. And, and then one day, Brian and I, when he was about four, we realized, hmm, this kid's pretty crafty. Turns out he knew exactly what he was doing. He had learned to manipulate us that when he wanted his way, if I cry louder, if I whine a little with a little more gusto, then I'm going to get what I want. So as parents, we had to kind of sit back and say, whoa, 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 okay, that's not on him. That's really on us. And once we put a plan in place, kind of like taking control of that behavior in him, it was, hey, AJ, you know what? When you start to cry and whine, you're going to go to your room and you're going to sit by yourself until you get yourself under control. And when you can come out and use your words and tell us what's going on, then we'll have a conversation. And I can't tell you what a relief that was for me as I felt like, okay, we have a plan. We have a purpose of what we're trying to do. And that brought so much relief to me instead of just reacting constantly to everything that was happening. And here's the goal. When we have a plan, we can be proactive. That's the better position to be in. Proactive means we can be engaged and we're ready so that when the balls come firing at us, instead of just ducking for cover and hoping for the best, we can say, we can pick that ball up and say, all right, how does this situation affect our, <clears throat> our family mission statement? How does this play into the values that we have or to, or to the vision my kids have for their own future? And put it in its proper perspective and come to a place of being proactive instead of reactive. And let me just give an example of that. I don't know what you're like when you're in a car and when you know where you're going. When we go on a family vacation and we know what our destination is, we're chit-chatty, we've got music on, we're eating snacks, we're talking and just living it up. It's a great time. Look how beautiful the state is that we live in. But when we're in a car trying to get somewhere and we don't know where we're going, you wouldn't want to be in our car. My kids can attest to this. A couple months ago, we were in Portland. My son was in a basketball tournament. We've never been to that city. We had no idea where we were going. 
Our navigation took us literally to an apartment complex. We were supposed to be at a huge gym. So we're like, okay, this something's not right. So the stress in our car <laughs> when we were lost and didn't know where we were going, music was off. Brian and I are chipping at each other. Kids, shut up. Be quiet. Oh, I shouldn't say that in church. Be quiet. You know, no snacks. Everyone just be quiet. We don't know where we're going. We were so stressed out. And I think that that's how we can be as parents. It's like being in that car. When we know where we're going, we can enjoy the moment. And we don't have to wig out over every little situation that comes along. But when we don't know what our destination is, when we don't know where we're going, we're just going to react to every little thing and get lost in in the stuff that doesn't need to derail us as much. Yeah, so if you, I encourage you, if you're, if you're parents and you have little kids at home, do that five-point clarity for parenting. Do it with your small group or the mentor, just with your spouse. Fill that thing out. So Tracy and I filled it out for, for the family, but then we actually, if you've got older kids, we actually had our kids fill one out for themselves, just their personal mission statement. It's re, it was really a helpful tool. And when Tracy mentioned we put that up on our pantry door, it's just been really good for us because Part of what we're doing, we'll talk more about this next week and the week after, is we're trying to raise kids who take ownership and responsibility of their own stuff, right? Not just who are just little robots that we're forcing and we're, we're, we're trying to make all the decisions for them. So we're helping to do that. In fact, in week three, we're going to talk about the, the stages of parenting. We're going to talk about the different, as kids get older, the different stages and how you help them through those stages. But I can already hear it, uh, someone that maybe it, that doesn't really... Uh, ascribe to a biblical worldview, they might already be sort of throwing flags at us on this. Because, because if you were to turn on the TV and, or go, go on a YouTube channel with some just secular person who's talking about parenting, they're probably, they're, one of their main things they're going to say is, no, don't parent on purpose. You let your kids do what they want. Don't discipline your kids. Let them discover what's right and wrong. Let them... Let them you need to just nurture what they feel is true, what they feel is right. And here's, here's the thing. I mean, that's, listen, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but if you're a follower of Jesus, that should not be the opinion you have as a Christian parent. The, the, what the Bible says, and it's very clear, the Bible says that without the guidance of parents, many kids will default to a path of selfishness and destruction. That's the default path for a kid. The default path is not to be a good kid. I, I know this is maybe a little controversial these days, but let's not forget what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are by default selfish and broken. That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that by default we're all good. Now, I'm not saying we're as bad as we can possibly be. There's, there's, there's the spark of divinity in all of us, right? There, we're created in the image of God, and there's, there's good in every human being, of course. But there is definitely sin in every human being and sin and sin is just simply following your own path choosing your own way instead of God's way well that's how we've always defined sin and our kids know that and we want to make sure that they know our job is to help them get on the right path our job isn't just to help them forge along their own path and find what they feel is right or true for them and define themselves however they want to define themselves. Our job is to help them to see how God defines them and how God defines us. I, I, I can already hear some people just saying, how dare you say God gets to define me? Okay, fine, that can be your opinion. But if you're a follower of Jesus, listen to me, God gets to define you. He gets to define who you are. He gets to tell you what's right and wrong. He's God, you're not. You're not in charge of your own life. And that's one of the things we want to teach our kids is God defines us. God tells us what's right. We submit to God. And so when we teach our kids to submit to us, we're, getting them, we're moving them on the path to submit to God on their own in life, right? Here's what the Bible says about it. Proverbs 22, 6 is a popular verse. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I know some people say, don't use that word. Don't use that word should. It's offensive. You're offending me. Don't tell me what I should do and what I shouldn't do. Well, that Bible says it. So I'm going to read it again. <laughs> train, up a, train up a child in the way he should go. If you're not a Christian, you can reject this. If you're a Christian parent, you should really wrestle with this. What this means is there's a way that your child 
should go. What this means is there's a right and there's a wrong. That's what the Bible teaches. And parents, our job, now we're not perfect at this, but our job is to train up our children in the way they should go. In other words, we should help them onto the right path. We shouldn't just help them discover their own path. Now again, I'm not saying you, that, that means you micromanage every decision they make and what job they have and what person they marry and all that stuff. That's not, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we're trying to create a bunch of robots. But I am saying that when it comes to teaching values and biblical principles, we should do everything we can as parents to train them up in that way. Because if we don't, trust me, the enemy is very intentional about training up our kids for us. Satan is very strategic. He is very purposeful. So if you're not purposeful, then your kids are going to be influenced, whether they know it or not, they're going to be influenced by the world and how the world is trying to get them to go. So parents, we have to be purposeful and train them up in the way that they should go. And I, I want to say two things about this. Number one, I'm not saying that we're trying to raise just a bunch of like hyper-spiritual kids. That's not the goal here. Kids that can't relate to real people that don't know Jesus. That's not the goal. Our goal isn't to get our kids to memorize every verse in the Bible so that they're just shooting scripture verses at teachers and friends all throughout their life. Like that is not the picture. We want our kids to embrace a biblical worldview and we want them to see the world through this lens. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to help our kids do. Okay, we'll talk more about that next week. Second thing I want to say about this. A lot of, a lot of parents use this and they feel very judged and they feel very um, guilty and shameful because they look at this because if, you've, if you know anyone that has kids that have not followed, they're not really following Jesus, then it, as a parent you'll look at this and you'll, fe you'll, fe you'll feel very condemned. Because you'll feel like, I've failed. The Bible says this. In fact, I remember years ago when Alpine was young, we had, a, we had a young couple in a small group and an older couple in the same small group. And we were talking about parenting and we were talking about this verse and the young, the young guy, and he just he had, had a newborn. That's all he had, a brand new baby. And he, he says, this is a promise from the Bible that if you do your job right, then your kids will follow Jesus. And this older couple had a kid that didn't, wasn't following Jesus at the time. And the older couple like just sat there. It was a very awkward conversation in the small group. And the older couple just sat there just like, how could you say that? And, and the young guy was like, because it says it right there in the Bible. Do you believe in the Bible or not? And it, became, it began this debate and this young, obnoxious, arrogant father of a six-month-old is trying to tell these other parents how to do it. And I remember <laughs> the older parents, they just finally gave up and they just said, how about just call us in 15 years? Let's have this conversation again, right? Here's the thing, guys. This is a principle. It's not a promise. Proverbs are not promises. They're principles. If God the Father has children who rebelled against him, and he does, how could that be a promise? You saying God is a bad father? I'm not saying that you, you, maybe that some parents don't screw up and make poor choices and whatever, but the bottom line is every individual, including our kids, have to make their own choices. The principle is this. Here's, here's the principle I don't want you to miss. The principle is parents, you should be purposeful and you, should re you really should do your best to train up your child. You're going to screw up. You're not going to be perfect. And at the end of the day, your kids are going to have to make their own choices. That's what we tell Kenzie now. She's, she's a couple years away from making her own choices. I mean, really for, for real, like she can do whatever she wants because she's not going to be in her home anymore. And our hope is that she continues to follow God. Our hope is that we did a good enough job and that the grace of God covers over our mistakes. But at the end of the day, we can only do our part, right? She has to do her part. God has to do his part as well. And so that's the principle. And there's one more thing then. Well, and I just want to say too, something that I have to say to myself and I, in talking to friends as we talk about our struggles in parenting and the failures that we have, that just remember tomorrow is a new day. <laughs> and if you're sitting here and you're like, oh man, I, it's too late. I, we don't have a plan. We haven't had a purpose. I don't know what my focus and direction is. It's too late for us. No, tomorrow is a new day. And for me, there's many days where I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I lost my cool again. I raised my voice again. I, you know, this isn't what I want to model for my kids. I did it wrong. 
that I just have to say to myself, tomorrow's a new day. I can do better tomorrow. So don't, don't, don't be discouraged if you're sitting there today like, I have no clue what to do with this, and it's too late. My kids are already well on their way to whatever they're going to do. It's not too late. And start finding purpose in parenting, and it'll go a long way for you. And, and what we want to finish with today, then, is just a helpful framework uh, that we hope for parents. If you want to know how to win at parenting, this framework will be helpful to you. Because in our world, I think a lot of parents feel like, I've done well if um, my kid is happy and they follow their dreams, and they're doing their passions. And that's true, and there's definitely value to that, but that's not the end-all, be-all. Some of you might be sitting there saying, well, if my, if my kid is successful and does well in whatever they choose, and they make a lot of money, then I'll feel pretty good as a parent. I'll feel like I won. I set them up for success. Well, I mean, you know, making money and stuff is good and is helpful, but it, again, it's not the end-all, be-all. And maybe some of you are sitting there saying, well, Winning as a parent has meant that they left and moved somewhere else. And, and I can cross, you know, check the box. So, and, and again, we, we want to launch our kids into independence. But again, we want to make sure that we're launching them so that they can continue in their life and have the right framework. And so the framework that we use, the goal of Christian parenting is, ra is to raise kids who pursue God full circle. So here's our full circle thing here that hopefully you guys have seen. And the idea is, as parents, this is what Brian and I are trying to raise our kids with this framework, that they needed to start a relationship with God by putting their trust in Jesus. And they both did that at seven or eight years old. But we're teaching them every week about trusting in Jesus for everything in their life, right? It doesn't stop at just putting your faith in Jesus. There's a lot to learn for all of us. And what does it mean to trust in Jesus when I didn't make the team? This is when I cry as a parent, when they, when they don't get the part in the play, when they're sad and devastated. We have to teach them to trust in Jesus and to learn how to work through it and to pray through it. Sorry. You thought I was the emotional one. I know. You do cry almost every sermon. So, so it's just a heart of a parent because I know we all sit there and we want the best for our kids, and sometimes it's hard. So the next thing is then if we want them to live to honor God, we have to train and talk to our kids about that all the time because they're being inundated on the bus, at school, TV shows, movies, music. It's all, all the stuff coming at them is not good. It is not a, a biblical worldview. So we're having to have very intentional conversations with our kids. How do you honor God in a world that could care less about his opinion? So we have to teach them and talk to them about that. So that's part of our framework that's always before us. Guys, how do we need to trust Jesus more? Okay, well, how do you honor God in that situation? And then the last thing is we mature and we grow in our faith when we're helping others. And so Brian and I are trying to model that in our own home, that we have a family devotional time set aside every week. And I'm not going to lie to you. There are some weeks that it comes and goes. For us, we decided it was Thursday night over dinner. It works in our schedule best right now. But there's some Thursday nights that come and go. But we're doing our best to make that a priority because we want our kids to see that us helping them is modeling then what we hope for them, which is that they will go and help others. And that's the full circle pursuit and that framework that we're trying to use in our family to give direction to our parenting. Yeah, and so this is what we, you thought we wrote, founda this is from Foundations, if you know Foundations. You thought we wrote it for you. We wrote it for our kids because we, we, we don't want our kids to view Christianity as a complicated thing. We just don't want them to. We want, we want them to be wholehearted Christians for the rest of their life. So we had to try to break it down into a simple framework for them, and that's, this is what we use. So we're not just saying this. We really do use this as our framework for parenting and for mentoring and everything. And I encourage you to do, if you're a Christian, I really encourage you to use it. In fact, if you've, if you've got kids in Kids Church today, we're not teaching kids how to be better parents today. We're actually, we're actually just doing foundations for kids over the next three weeks in Kids Church. And the reason we did it like that is because we want you to be able to go home and have these regular conversations with your kids and start teaching them that. Use it as a framework and because uh, this is the win. And it's not just the win for our kids. It's the win for us. We're not trying to do, have our kids do something that we're not willing to do. We, we have made a commitment to living this way. And we want our kids to make a commitment to living this way too. And then we'll all grow old together pursuing God together, and, and playing dodgeball in heaven later. Pegging him with the 
with the ball. I just want to do something with that analogy. I think it's a great analogy. All right, let's finish with David. Okay, so here's what David said at the end of his life. He's, he says, he's got his kids and grandkids. He's gathered them together. He says, I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. That's another way of saying I'm about to kick the bucket. That's what that means. So he's about to die. This literally, these literally are his deathbed words. He said, take courage and be a man. I love that. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all of his ways. Remember, he's talking to his sons and grandsons right now. Probably great, great grandsons also. Take courage, be a man, observe the requirements of the Lord your God, follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commandments, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. You know what he's saying here? On his deathbed, he's being purposeful. How much better would it have been if he would have been purposeful at the beginning of his parenting journey <laughs> instead of at the end? He's saying, hey guys, hey kids, Adonijah, Absalom, Solomon, here's how you win. Honor God. He didn't have trust Jesus yet in his circle, but he had honor God. Honor God. Here's how you win. Honor God. But wouldn't it have been such a different story if he would have said that at the beginning? And if he would have been purposeful about that instead of saying it at the end? Listen, if you're, if you're a parent and you've struggled with this and you feel like, man, I have not done a good job with it, it's not, like Tracy said, it's not too late. If you're a grandparent, it's not too late. You can still have an impact on your, on your adult children raising, raising kids. And I just, we're just going to pray. We're going to close and just pray for all of our families and all the parents right now. So let's pray together. God, I praise you for your word and I praise you for your truth. And Lord, I pray for this particular uh, message. I know, I know parenting's hard. Um, some people can't relate to it. Some people can relate to it. Some people feel shame or guilt about it or, or they feel like they're a failure. But God, I, I just pray that your grace would cover over all of that. And Lord, that you just really would, would put a, a spirit of leadership in our homes. God, I pray for every father and mother, every grandfather and every grandmother, Lord God, that you would do it just a work in them for your sake. God, I pray for our kids. I pray for grandkids. God, that we would, really, we would have a culture, God, from this day forward. We, have just, we would have a culture that we would leave a legacy of people who are following God, children who are following God because parents are following God. And Jesus, it's not going to work because we set our mind to it or because we have a great, great resolve. It's going to work, God, because you are behind it and you're empowering us to do it. So I pray for that strength and that power for every parent and I pray over every family in Jesus' name. Amen.